You may have noticed this week, if you follow our Facebook page or get our emails, um, that I put out a reading plan for the books of First and Second Samuel. Uh, those are in conjunction with where we're going to be spending our time on Sundays in Scripture. Uh, and so the idea is, is that you can now read the portion that we are going to study on a Sunday morning in the week leading up to that sermon. It will help because we're going to be covering some larger portions of Scripture now. Um, the last two weeks, you've been spoiled because we've, uh, we've been able to tackle some smaller sections that you've been able to follow along with. But now we are going to start tackling some bigger portions, chapters at a time. It'd be great if you could read ahead and be prepared as you come on a Sunday morning to uh, not feel lost as we might be moving a little bit quicker. Today, we are going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 11. We're going to be going all the way through chapter 3 to the end of that chapter. So like I said, a bigger portion. We're not going to take the time to read that full portion today, but I am going to do my best to summarize it for you. And we're going to talk today about God's guidance if you were to look right away at the beginning of where we are studying in verse 11, you're going to see kind of a theme, and it starts with contrast. We see in verse 11, Samuel is identified, and then right away in verse 12, we see the sons of Eli. And I want you to recognize right at the beginning this contrast, because verse 11 of chapter 2 says Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. The very next verse, even though you might have a heading in your Bible that separates those two verses, it's still the very next verse. Verse 12 gives us this contrast. We have Samuel who's serving the Lord, and then we have the sons of Eli were worthless men, it says. They did not know the Lord. Right off the bat, we're confronted with this great contrast and what it does for me is it draws me into this topic and theme of salvation and redemption because we suddenly see the difference of following God's guidance in Samuel and he's ministering to the Lord and we're immediately met with not following God's guidance because the sons of Eli are worthless men and they don't know the Lord. So right away, we're drawn into this bigger understanding that this is about redemption, that following God's guidance is key because we're met with this contrast. I want you to be thinking through that because contrast is a big, um, big point of emphasis today. You might be already caught up on the word choice. The sons of Eli were worthless. How could you possibly proclaim that about someone, that they're worthless? That word is probably better defined as scoundrels or wicked or unwise, meaning it's unwise to not follow the Lord. They don't know the Lord, and so of course they are wicked. They're gonna do things based on their own sinful desires. So when you see that word, don't get caught up in the word worthless. It just means that they don't know the Lord, and so they're wicked men. The sons of Eli were wicked. So we have to see the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things. So we look to God's guidance for the right way to do things. So if you were to follow along in verse 12 through 17, we're gonna see the first point of today about God's guidance. So if you're making an outline, you could write God's guidance at the top. If you're taking notes, those underlined words that are on the screen will help you fill in the blanks if you picked up a copy of the notes at the door or if you're on the Church Center app, there's some blanks you can fill in. The very first thing that we recognize in, these portion, in this portion, verses 12 through 17, is that the sons of Eli ignored God's guidance. What was the right way to do what they were doing? Well, what we see in this following story is that they are handling the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices that are brought to them. They work in the temple with their high priest dad, Eli, and they're in charge of handling and instructing people on how to sacrifice the parts of the animals. So for example, how is it supposed to be handled? Well, the very first thing that we know historically is that the fat from the sacrifice was to be burned as an offering to the Lord. That was one thing that we know from Leviticus chapter 17 or Numbers chapter 18. 
God gave his guidance on how it was supposed to happen. That fat was the Lord's portion. And then the second thing that we know from Leviticus 7 and Deuteronomy 18 is that there were certain parts of the sacrifice that were allotted to the priests for food, specifically the breast of the animal and the right thigh. That's how God guided this process to happen. And so what we see actually is how the sons of Eli were handling it. I am going to read verses 13 through 16, and then I'll summarize it so we are all clear in the understanding. But if you're in 1 Samuel chapter 2, we see that the fat is supposed to be the Lord's portion, and the priests are limited on what they're supposed to get from the sacrifice. But let's see what happens and how the sons of Eli handle it. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servants would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the, the fork, fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Notice it says, all that would be brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, remember the fat is the Lord's portion, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who is sacrificing, give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. Well, if it's raw, then they couldn't have burned the fat portion, which was the Lord's portion. So we're starting to see what's happening here. So he says, give meat for the priest to roast. He will not accept boiled meat, but only raw. So as a summary, we have the sons of Eli. Later on in verse 34, their names are Hophni and Phinehas. We have Hophni and Phinehas who are exploiting the people that they were supposed to serve. They were actually taking whatever they could get by spearing it with a fork instead of getting what was intended. Remember, there were allotments that they were supposed to follow by God's guidance. And then we saw that the fat was the Lord's portion but they were taking things before the Lord's portion was burned off. And what we see later on in verse 22 is that they were actually turning the tent of meeting, the entrance to the tent of meeting, as a place to pick up women and sleep with them. They were a disgrace and an abomination to God. They were not following his guidance. They ignored his guidance. If you were to continue reading or if we were to summarize how they acted, they acted with greed and dissatisfaction. They were taking for themselves even from the Lord. They were going to people and saying, you have to give this right now. They were acting out of that grieve and dissatisfaction. Even in verse 16, it tells us that they will take it by force. So they were acting with aggression. These were not humble, gentle, spirited people. They were aggressive, prideful, greedy they were ignoring the guidance of God. Verse 17 actually says this, thus the sin of the young men was so great in the sight of the Lord for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. And so they acted with contempt. We're starting to see this contrast because remember, we were told right away that Samuel was serving the Lord and the sons of Eli were worthless or wicked. Now we can see why they would be given that title. But I want you to notice in verse 17, real quick, it says, the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. Just a quick nugget here. All sin is against God. Their sin was affecting other people and the sacrifices they were bringing. Their sin was affecting them. But who is sin against? It's against a holy God. Even if you think you have sin that's individual in your life and nobody knows about it, that sin is against a holy, righteous God. And we see that in verse 17. It's a great little reminder that's snuck in there. In the sight of the Lord, their sin was great and it is against him. And so we have this, this context here of the sons of Eli being worthless and wicked and they're abusing their power. They're not following the guidance of God. They're ignoring it. But then suddenly, verse 18 shifts that. And we see this great contrast again. Verse 18 tells us that Samuel followed God's guidance. If we were to look at verses 18 through 21 as a section, we would see that Samuel is following the guidance of God. And so you start to see this picture of what it looks like to follow God 
and not follow God. Those are the two choices. And we're going to see throughout this story that contrast. Verse 18 quickly jumps in and it says that Samuel was ministering before the Lord. Verse 18 says that. I'm sorry, my notes were messed up. Samuel was ministering before the Lord. Right away in the midst of this scandal, this sin, this influence from the other people, the other sons of Eli, Samuel was actually a testimony of grace to stay dedicated and stay committed to what he knew was right. Do you imagine the pressure that he felt while other people are mishandling the guidance of God? Here's Samuel standing firm and ministering to the Lord before the Lord. He stood out from the corruption that surrounded him, just like we have to. Through the power of Jesus Christ, we have to stand strong against a culture that wants to redefine things, wants to tell us how we should do it, wants to interpret this through their own lens instead of through the way that God intended. And so we have to stand firm through the power of Jesus. But it wasn't just his behavior that stood out. Verse 18, the end of it, made me chuckle this week. In verse 19, when it describes Samuel, he stood out as ministering before the Lord, but then even his look was set apart because it says he was a boy clothed with a linen ephod. An ephod, an elaborate one, was actually reserved for the high priest. And it was a garment that was one of importance and distinction. And so his behavior stood out amongst the sons of Eli as righteous, but so did his look. He was set apart. And I want you to see the verse that made me chuckle this week. Look at verse 19. It says, his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Remember, Hannah had given Samuel, she saw him, what we know for sure, was a minimum of once a year when they went to Shiloh and offered a sacrifice. And every year she would bring a brand new robe for him. And it made me chuckle because this verse just stood out because of the word little, she made for him a little robe. But it made me think about Christmas, of course, right? Surprise, surprise, Josh is thinking about Christmas. It made me think about those gifts maybe you get from your grandmother. You get a sweater every year, and you're like, oh, wow, thanks for the sweater. And I imagine, just, just imagine Samuel's reaction. He's so excited to see mom. Mom's excited to see him. And here she is, and she goes, oh, I got you another robe, and he goes, oh, mom, this is so not cool. It makes me itch. This linen just isn't comfortable. Nobody else's mom does this. And she's like, but I love you. You're my gift from God, right? And it made me chuckle thinking about it. It actually reminded me of a Christmas movie. You know, the Christmas story where Ralphie from his Aunt Clara gets the pink bunny costume. Maybe you can see, you remember that? And he comes downstairs like, this is the worst. And his dad agrees. And his mom is like, this is adorable. I put all of that, not because scripture tells us all of this, but I find it humorous to think of those real interactions between a mom and his son. And the mom is saying, I'm going to equip you every year so that it always fits you. And as humorous as it is, it brings us to a good point of parenting. Because Hannah was so dedicated to the purpose of God for Samuel's life that she spent the year making sure that he would further be equipped to handle himself in the presence of the Lord and serving the Lord. What a great parenting illustration that is, that she took her time, she invested into it so that her son would still be set apart and there wouldn't be any hindrance, like I've outgrown this robe that's supposed to set me apart visually. She said, no, I got that. I'm taking care of that. So it's a great little truth that's right in there, a great parenting move by Hannah. But the important part of this is that Samuel followed God's guidance. That's what happens in verses 18 through 21. But now, here's that contrast again. We flip the script in verse 22, and suddenly we see the consequence of rejecting God's guidance. So we've already gotten the ignoring God's guidance, the following God's guidance. There's got to be a consequence for rejecting the guidance of God, and we see it in verses 22 through 36. There's a big section here that we're going to deal with. The very first thing that we see as a consequence for not following God's guidance is rebuke. In verse 25, it says that Eli confronts his sons about their behavior, and then we're told that they would not listen to the voice of their father. They were doing their own thing. 
as a believer, my father is in heaven, not my actual physical father, he's in India, but my heavenly father, I need to listen to his voice. I need to be able to say, I will listen to the voice of my father. Verse 25 says that Eli's sons did not listen to the voice of their father when he rebuked them. And Eli did the right thing here, but it was incomplete. He went to them and he told them that their behavior was wrong in that moment. But who's the high priest? Do you remember? It's Eli. All along, Eli could have been rebuking them and correcting them and giving them consequences for ignoring God's guidance, and he didn't. And so what we actually see is that Eli only did half of what he needed to. He rebuked them, but without any sort of consequence to their actions. And we see in verses 27 through 36, the ultimate result of not following God's guidance is rejection. You might have a heading in your Bible over top of verse 27 that says, the Lord rejects Eli's household. They knew the way they were supposed to go. They knew that God was supposed to be followed in his guidance and they ignored him and they even mocked him. And we see the consequence is rejection. And here's what it says in verse 29 as God is talking to Eli. He's saying, why then do you, Eli, scorn my sacrifices and offerings that I command for you for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest part of every offering, offering for my people Israel? The implication here with verse 29 is that Eli was doing the same things as his sons, fattening himself on the Lord's portion. Remember, the fat of the sacrifice was the Lord's portion. Here he is, God is saying, you're doing the same thing. And even though we don't specifically have the text that says Eli did the exact same thing, at the very least, we know that Eli was in charge. As the high priest, he observed what was happening. He knew. And he could have at any moment stepped in when he saw the ignoring of God's guidance, the blasphemy against God, the mockery of God's system of what he put into place. Eli at any moment could have said, sons, stop it. And I'm gonna take you out of service in this temple because you are not handling yourselves by the guidance of God. But he didn't do that. And now we see rejection of his entire household. And now going back to the beginning, I think you're starting to see the picture of the consequences of following God's guidance and not following God's guidance. Because ultimately, if we ignore the guidance of God through Jesus Christ, our Savior, you will be rejected. You have made that mind up. And we're seeing that this story all the way back in 1 Samuel draws our attention to a Savior, Jesus Christ. And our response to that Savior, Jesus Christ, must be acceptance of what he has done for us. Eli did not give consequences. Another parenting move here. We already saw Hannah with a great parenting move. We see Eli without a great parenting move. Consequences are important. They reinforce your words. He could rebuke them all the day long, but then they were just gonna continue to do it. It says in verse 25, they ignored him. They didn't care what he said. What's gonna make that truth stick home? The consequence. Eli could have been a better father in this moment, but he did not. And so his whole household is rejected. Verse 31 gives us the details. It says, Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house so there will not be an old man in your house. His lineage will not continue. You may think this is extreme, but the reality is God's guidance is there for Eli and for his sons and they chose to reject it. They even mocked it. So it's very simple, reject God and it leads to destruction. Follow God through Jesus and it leads to eternal life. And so this whole time we're pointing towards the reality of needing a savior. We just finished chapter two, if you've been following along, so we can celebrate because we're two chapters deep into this long study. But we're gonna go into chapter three and we're gonna continue this process of contrast and guidance. We see the guidance of God. So we've seen the consequence of not following God's guidance. Now, let's flip back. We had Eli's sons ignoring it. We see their consequence. Now, let's see what happens when someone follows the guidance of God, Samuel, 
He's going to hear God's guidance in chapter 3, specifically verses 1 through 14. So chapter 3 starts off with an eye-opening truth about the present day in 1 Samuel. Look at verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. You see, the time, the theme of what was happening around them is that the word of the Lord was not being preached. People were not receptive. And ultimately, that kind of falls on the high priest to make sure that everyone knows the power of God and the importance of following guidance. And so we see the result of that. But what we see is that Eli and his sons were not doing their job And so God rejects them, but at the same time, he brings someone to power who is going to handle themselves rightly, and that person is Samuel. Because in verse one, it tells us, Samuel was ministering to the Lord. You recognize a theme with this statement? How many times already have we seen Samuel was ministering to the Lord? Samuel was serving the Lord. Samuel was doing these things rightly. Eli's sons were not. And so we see that Samuel's ministering to the Lord, still faithful, And Eli is growing older and dim. Now, over the next several verses, specifically verses 4 through 14, we're going to see an interaction between Samuel, Eli, and God. Some of the verses are going to be on the screen, but let me summarize it for you. Over this next section, Eli hears a voice. And he, I'm sorry, Samuel hears a voice. He thinks it's Eli's voice. And so Samuel, upon hearing this voice that he thinks is Eli's, runs to Eli and he says, what do you need? And Eli says, I didn't didn't call for you. Let me sleep. You go back to sleep as well. That back and forth happens two more times, three total times where Samuel hears a voice, runs to Eli. Eli says, go back and sleep. After the third time, Eli finally catches on. Remember, he's growing old and dim, and he's taking a while to figure out what's going on. But by the third time, he tells Samuel, oh yeah, I think that's the Lord speaking to you. That's not me. That's the Lord speaking to you. So he tells Samuel, here's what you need to say. If you hear that voice again, you need to reply. Uh, Let's see, verse nine of chapter three. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Eli shows that we go to the Lord in humility, identifying himself as a servant, telling God that I want to hear what you have to say. So speak, Lord, your servant hears, verse 9. And what happens? The voice is heard again. And Samuel, Samuel replies in the way that Eli taught him. And the Lord responds to Samuel, and he tells him something that he wants Samuel to say. He gives him his word and he entrusts Samuel with that word to be delivered to the people. And so what we notice here in this interaction is that Samuel is now called to be a prophet, the mouthpiece of God to deliver his truth for his glory. And what does God tell Samuel? He tells Samuel that everything that he said about Eli's household is going to be fulfilled. Eli's household is rejected and it will crumble. And now Samuel, having heard God's guidance, has a choice to make. Because here's Eli, who was basically a father to him, raised him in the ways of the Lord, showed him what to do, and is even still teaching him in his old age by saying, here's how you hear the word of the Lord. Here's your response to the Lord. Samuel now has really bad news. He has a choice to make. Am I going to go to Eli and give him this bad news? Or am I going to change this news or only deliver part of it so that Eli isn't upset? Or am I just going to be quiet completely? I say those three options because we see that in our culture today. We have been given a word to declare fully. We have a choice to make. Are we going to just read parts of it that fit the agenda and the tickling ears of people? Are we going to ignore it completely, maybe hide it and not talk about it because it's offensive? Or are we going to open up every part of it and declare the word of God? We will declare the entire word of God. And so let's see what Eli does. What choice did he make? Is he going to be quiet or is he going to deliver the truth? And so that's where we find ourselves in 1 Samuel chapter 3. If you look at verses 15 through 18, we see that not only did Samuel hear the guidance of God, but he speaks God's guidance. 
It tells us in verse 15 that Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. He didn't want to upset him. He had a heart for him and he cared for him. And he said, this, this leaves me in anguish. I don't want to deliver bad news, but we do see that Samuel made the right choice. And he declared the truth of God, even though it was difficult. Verse 18 tells us, Samuel told him, Eli, everything and hid nothing from him. Eli asks Samuel what he had heard and Samuel is heart-wrenched to tell Eli, but he's faithful. And he tells him all the way down to the very last word, what the Lord told him to speak. Earlier, we saw the sons of Eli adjust the truth with sacrificing to fit their own comfort, their own preferences, to fill their own bellies. But here we see Samuel declare the truth without hiding any of it, without twisting any of it. And now we see this shift has been made historically from the household of Eli to now a faithful servant, Samuel, who will deliver the truth even though it's difficult. I want to pause because we are almost actually done with chapter three. We're all the way up to verse 18, and it only goes through verse 21. But before we tackle 19 through 21, I want to very briefly pause, and I want to recap what we've learned so far. Because we've seen God's guidance quite a bit here. We either accept it, Samuel, or we reject it, Eli's sons. And we've seen the consequences of that. And suddenly we start to say, this is really important to follow God's guidance. So I want to take a break or a pause. And I want to give you very, three very simple things that you can take home with you that we see from this story. And that is the ways of God's guidance. How does God guide us? There are many different ways we can get into. I'm just going to give you three very briefly. We see from this story that God guides through people. We saw that Hannah guided Samuel, her son, in the ways of the Lord. We see that Eli's sons guided Samuel on what not to do. You can learn from the Lord about what not to do by the example of others. And we see that Samuel learned what not to do based on what Eli's sons were doing. So God guides us through people. Eli guided Samuel with instruction in the temple and how to hear God's voice. We saw that even in his old age. And we see that Samuel is going to be used as a prophet to guide the people. So God guides through people. But God also guides us through his spirit. Samuel heard the audible voice of God so plainly, so clearly that he thought it was physically Eli shouting out to him. God spoke to him. And through his spirit, God speaks to us. We see in John chapter 16 and John chapter 14 that Jesus promises the spirit of God who is going to teach us and the spirit speaks from God so that we know and are guided by him. And in John 14, it says the spirit is identified as the one who will teach, instruct, and guide. And so if you find yourself not being guided by God or wondering how, he does it through people. He guides through his spirit, but he also guides us through his word. I know I said we weren't going to tackle verse 21, but just sneak ahead to verse 21 right now. It says, by the word of the Lord. How did he guide? By his word. He's given us his complete word in scripture. He's given us the Holy Spirit to teach us what scripture means so we can take that truth and be guided in our everyday life to glorify the name of Jesus Christ so he speaks to us through people. He guides us through his spirit. He guides us through his word. There's two things that I want to note before we tackle those last three verses. Hearing God above all the other noise in the world takes discipline. It takes growth. You notice that Samuel didn't know it was the word of the Lord. He needed help. Eli helped him see that this was God speaking to him. He was still young. He hadn't experienced that yet. He didn't know exactly what was happening. And so it takes discipleship. It takes one-on-one, -on -one, someone who is instructing you and helping you. It's okay to admit that you're immature in this area and you need someone mature to guide you. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. And so when you hear from God, above all of the other noise, that takes some work and some training and some discipline. But another quick note that I recognized about this that brought comfort to me is that God isn't hiding from you. 
God's guidance is available. It's not confusing on where to find it. He tells us where to find it. You've been told this morning that God is with you and for you and that he wants to guide you in growth so that you can glorify him. It's not confusing where to find it. And I say this because so often one of the main questions that I hear and that maybe you hear is what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to handle myself? That person offended me, what am I supposed to do? I don't like this situation, what am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do with my job, so I need someone to tell me. I don't know God's will. We're gonna get into, at the very end, what is the purpose of life? What is God's will? But the one thing I want you to see is that God's not hiding from you. His guidance is available. So let's jump back into verses 19 through 21. And I have four P words that I want you to see. Because at the end of this chapter, as we wrap it up, we have now this shift in history that the sons of Eli, the household of Eli is rejected. Now we have someone who will follow the guidance of God in the person of Samuel, who is gonna be God's mouthpiece as prophet and as priest. And we're gonna see the result of God's guidance. We saw the result of ignoring God's guidance is rebuke and redemption or uh, rejection. We see the result of following God's guidance. The first one is progress. Look at verse 19. It says that Samuel grew. Yes, he grew up physically, but when he was trusting in the Lord in every step, when he was surrounded in the ways of the Lord and his heart's cry was to serve God and follow his guidance, he not only grew up physically, he grew up spiritually. So following God's guidance results in maturity. Maturity in the ways of God, maturity in the understanding of who God is and the understanding of his plan in our lives. Previously, we saw the contrast between Samuel and the sons of Eli. And I want you to see something that's really kind of cool if you look at verse 26 of chapter two. I know we're going back, but it fits in this idea of progress. First Samuel 2, 26 tells us that the boy Samuel grew up or grew in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. I'm gonna to read to you a verse from Luke chapter two, verse 52, and I want you to see the similarity to these two verses because it says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. And so even down to the description of Samuel's growth, we see that our eyes are drawn to Jesus, the Savior who would come. The Old Testament is not just a history book that's meant to be read in its exact time frame. It points us to bigger things like redemption in Jesus Christ. And even in the description of Samuel, we see not a comparison in an unhealthy way, but a redirection of our thought even bigger than this story of Samuel to a Savior who would come, who grew up and saw progress as Jesus followed God's guidance for his life on earth. Progress is not possible without Jesus. Samuel trusted in the Lord and was strengthened. Jesus relied on his heavenly, heavenly father and he accomplished the will of God by going all the way to the cross. So we must rely on God's guidance for progress. But we also must rely on God's guidance for productivity, which is the next P word, Notice in verse 19, it says that none of his words, Samuel's words, fell to the ground. What does that mean? Everything that he said from the Lord was productive. It did something, whether Samuel could see that fruit or not, he was faithful to the guidance of God. He proclaimed the truth of God and it was productive. And if you look at verse 20, it even says, all Israel, all of Israel at that moment knew that Samuel was established as prophet of the Lord. They sent out a mass text message. No, it didn't work like that back then. How could everyone know that Samuel was who God appointed him to be if it wasn't for the power of God to make his declaration productive? Samuel couldn't scream loud enough for all of Israel to hear. God himself made it productive because Samuel trusted that God could do it. So we must rely on God's guidance to be productive, but we also find our sense of purpose through God's guidance. I'm gonna try not to dwell on this spot because it is really meaningful, but we're running out of time. But this sense of purpose is something that hits every single one of us. What's the point? 
What is the point of my life? What's the purpose that I serve? You might even find yourself this morning saying, I don't even have a purpose. And I'm here to tell you that that's a lie because it is woven into who you are as a creation of God himself that you have purpose. But we have to find our purpose in him and his guidance. Chapter three reveals to us that Samuel found his purpose as a priest and a prophet. Verse 20 tells us that Samuel is now identified as a prophet of the Lord. And verse 21 even tells us that God revealed himself to Samuel. Who is responsible for all of this happening? Who is responsible for bringing purpose into the life of Samuel? God revealing himself to Samuel shows Samuel his purpose. So a question is, are you looking for your purpose? Are you wondering what the point of this life is? You're not going to find that purpose apart from God. He's the creator. He created with purpose. Finding any other purpose to plug in there is to find emptiness and it will fail. God gives purpose. And so you might ask, what is the purpose? Two things that we see from Samuel. If you don't know what to do in life, here's your default of what you are supposed to do with your life. Number one, to glorify God. He is big enough that no matter what the circumstance is, you can glorify him because he is so great. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. It says all. So what's the purpose of life? Glorifying God. What do I do in this circumstance? Glorify God. How do I deal with that person who offends me? Glorify God. Over and over, our life is glorifying God in all things. And because you're, you're glorifying him, you are submitting your ways to him and you're following his ways. You're trusting that he has a plan for you. And then when you do that, you come to the second purpose. You serve him. If we would simplify things and just constantly repeat, am I glorifying him? Am I serving him? Am I glorifying him? Am I serving him? In these difficulties, in this joy that I'm feeling, in this hardship that I'm feeling, am I glorifying him? Am I serving him? You've been created to glorify God. You have been created to serve him in a way that he designed you to serve him. And that's where we get our purpose. We have passions and gifts and we serve his greater purpose. God is the one who gives purpose, not the world, not your friends, not the things of this world. It is God alone. And the very last thing that I want you to see, as a result of God's guidance, we have progress, we have productivity, we have purpose, but we also have his presence. Look at the powerful statement in verse 19. It says, for the Lord was with him. Do you know how powerful it is to know that God Almighty is with you? Do you know how hopeless circumstances are and the world wants to make you feel? And your defense against that is to either say, I can do it, or to say, I can't do it, but God can. Because God is with Samuel and he is with you through the power of Jesus Christ. We also see that God did not just appear once to Samuel. Look at verse 21. As we close chapter three, it says, the Lord appeared again at Shiloh. God is available. He is there for you. He is pursuing you constantly and saying, I haven't gone away from you. I haven't left. I am right here. Cling to me. Seek my guidance and I will show you your purpose. I will give you productivity. I will ignite for you a passion inside of you that I created you with. That's what God says about you. God's presence is critical in our lives. You see, the Holy Spirit is given to you when you are saved by the power of Jesus Christ and that Holy Spirit is your guide to feel God's presence in your life, to know his presence. So if you feel empty, alone, you don't have any direction, you've asked, what's the point? You have to seek God's guidance. It's the only answer. We saw from this passage as we closed chapter two and three of 1 Samuel that we need to follow God's guidance and it leads to God's continued presence, his direction, his favor, and his purpose. But to reject God's direction leads to rejection.
I'll say it again because I stumbled. To reject God's direction leads to rejection. For you and me, the difference is eternal. It's heaven versus hell. And the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. There is no hope for mankind. And that is why God sent Jesus to be the hope. And sin means rejection of God. And all of us have sinned. But Jesus took your sin to the cross so that you could receive forgiveness and eternal life. You just need to accept the truth and give your life to him. That's what Samuel did by following his guidance. That's what I've done. It's time for you. If that's you today, would you go to the back of the sanctuary during these last two songs? There's going to be elders that will meet you there. They're going to be waiting for you to answer your questions and to help you see that there is only two paths. One is following God's guidance and the other is not. And we know the results of both. But today as we sing these final two songs, I want to ask you a question. What's guiding you? Are you being guided by something other than God? Or are you able to look at your life with all of the categories and the distractions and say wholeheartedly that Christ is enough? Would you stand and declare that he is enough today?